Good morning. It's loud. <laughs> Happy New Year, everyone. Um, I can't think of a better way to bring in the new year than to be here uh, to worship our God. So uh, if you're visiting with us here at the Granberry Church, you're our honored guest, um, that we would ask that you stick around and, and let us say hi to you and uh, introduce ourselves. And um, I'm, I'm relatively new here as well, and some of you I've met two or three times because uh, we can't remember each other's names, <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> but we'd like to be able to say hi to you and get to know you. Um, as I already mentioned, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, let's spend some time and sing and worship our God. With that, we'll go ahead and get started. Mm. Lord, we come before Thee now. At Thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our suit disdain. Shall we seek Thee, Lord, in vain? Shall we seek Thee, Lord, in vain? Lord, on Thee our souls depend. In compassion now descend. Fill our hearts with Thy rich grace. next song, I might lead a little bit faster than I used to, so just stay with me on that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we hopelessly lost the way. You morning. Welcome to everybody this morning. We just want to convey to you that your presence is valued. It, it could be your first Sunday here. So if it's your first Sunday here, your presence is valued. And if you have been here since uh, long before Methuselah, then your presence is valued uh, as well. We're really glad that you are a part of our service. So if you'd be willing to 
to fill out your registration card. It's actually attached to the printed handout that you had uh, when you came in this morning. And there's one side for members and another side for guests. You just complete it and leave it there in the chair this morning. So in terms of resuming to at least some semblance of a normal schedule, we'll return to our Wednesday night diner at 5.30 this Wednesday, the 4th, and then we'll resume uh, classes soon. But this particular Wednesday, we're going to actually have a devotional service for Ukraine. Stan McBroom has put together what I think is an extraordinary and meaningful experience. So it'll be really different, something uh, that we would not normally do on a Wednesday night. That's, I think it'll be a, a very unique worship experience. That'll be at 6.30. Uh, we'll be all together right in here, all ages, and then we'll resume our regular classes next week. You may want to go on ahead and get your communion supplies. They should be right there in the chair in front of you. Then we have some receptacles there as you exit this morning if you want to place your contribution there. And, of course, we have online giving as well. I want to make you aware we have a new Wi-Fi system. And there on your printed handout as well has the name of the Wi-Fi system. The actual name of the system is GCLC. And then the password for everybody is GCLC1905. So if you happen to forget that, just remember that the church is at 1905 West Pearl Street. So GCLC1905 is the password. So you may want to go on and pause now. It would probably be a good time to go on and connect your phone, your other device. If you have an iPad or whatever that you're using this morning, we've done some work on our Wi-Fi system, hopefully to enhance service. And so if you want to go on and do that now, I'm sure it would be very, very helpful. We are going to participate in the Community Food Pantry. That's going to be this Friday, the 6th, starting at 8 o'clock at First United Methodist Church. This is an event that we host twice a year, once in the summer and once in the winter. And if you are willing to volunteer, it probably could be a chilly morning. I think it would be a great experience. Contact John Eccles sometime before Friday, and I know that uh, your help and assistance would be genuinely appreciated. Well, I tend to say the same thing on the first Sunday of a new year, and I think it probably needs to be said this morning. The party is over. Are you all aware of that? The party is over. It is time to resume more of a, a normal routine, but what I'm super excited about is preaching through the gospel of John. I cannot think of anything more exciting. So perhaps the most familiar text in John, I haven't even go as far to say one of the most familiar passages in scripture. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, there's a lot more in that chapter. There's so much that surrounds that one verse, so much that is said before and so much that is said afterward as well. But for our purposes this morning, just the very idea, the concept of belief and that's really what I'm going to underscore during the course of this entire sermon series focusing on the Gospel of John. Who have you come to believe in? As I mentioned some weeks ago, I just posed a question. If we were to go around the room this morning and say, do you believe in Jesus? And even more fundamentally, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? I think down to a person, everybody would say, well, of course I do. But the intent in John, John's intent in writing his gospel was to help people that he was addressing come to a, a genuine belief in Jesus, but the depth of belief, the depth of our understanding of the very character of Jesus. Okay, you believe in him, but are, there are some specific things do you believe? So I'm going to ask two quick questions almost every single week. This is going to be repeated, but I think they're important. The first one is, do you believe? Fill in the blank. For example, do you believe that Jesus was raised on the third day? Do you believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus? So various truths that we're going to be exposed to in the Gospel of John, just as pause on that particular passage and say, do you believe this? Do you really believe this? And then the second follow-up question will be, well, if that's the case then, how does that truth impact your faith? Every week, every passage that we look at and spend time with, and John, do you, do you believe this? 
And if you do, how does that impact your faith? How does that shape the depth of belief that you have in him? So this morning as we begin a, what I'm going to refer to as a complimentary passage, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It's, it's a great passage for the first Sunday of a year. So as he begins Hebrews, the writer says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. And then he goes on to say, the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. So the universe was made through him. He is the exact representation of his being, the exact representation of God. So when we see Jesus, we have this this concept in the most personal, intimate way possible of who God really is is. So this morning, we'll focus on John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 during our sermon time together. Two questions. Here's the first one. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus was instrumental in the creation of the universe? And then the follow-up question, of course, is how does that truth, how does that particular truth impact and shape your faith today? so glad that you're part of our worship time. I think our time in John is going to be especially rich. Let's ask for God's blessings on this, uh, this first Sunday of 2023. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful. Thankful that we can call you our creator. Thankful that you continue to sustain us and sustain life itself. We're grateful for the complexity of the universe that you created for us to enjoy. We're grateful for each other, grateful for others whom we get to interact with who are also created in your image. Father, we are thankful, just thankful to be here this morning to worship. We pray in the name of Jesus, amen. If you would, please uh, stand for this next medley of three songs. Um, One thing that I would point out that might be helpful is as we transition into the next song, um, you'll notice at the top right um, a red asterisk on that slide. So it kind of gives you a cue that we're about to change to a new, a different song. Come, Christians, join to sing, Alleluia, Amen. Loud praise to Christ our King, Alleluia, Amen. Level with heart and voice, before His strong rejoice, praises His gracious choice, Alleluia.
Please be seated. As we reflect on the cross and as we are about to partake of the Lord's Supper, um, I couldn't think of a better song than just to sing to Christ that we adore him. Christ, we Good morning. Welcome to the first day of the new year. If you're like me, when I was younger, I always wanted to make New Year's resolutions for whatever reason there was, <laughs> and seldom did I ever fulfill most of those resolutions. But in Lamentations 2, God renews our, his mercy to us each and every morning. That is the resolution he gives to us. We're going to read in Philippians 2 in a minute about Christ's humility in giving his equality with God to come to earth and sacrifice his life for us and God's exaltation or elevating of Jesus as his son. Philippians 2, verse 5 through 8. In our relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who bringing, being in the very nature, God did not consider equality with, did not consider equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in the human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on the cross. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you just asking for forgiveness of our sins. We're so thankful that you renew your mercy to us each and every day. Without that, we would, we would be lost and unable to be a light in this world. Just continue to be with us each day. Continue to let us humble ourselves before you. We ask these things in your loving son's name. Amen.
We continue on in verse 9. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That is the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You pray with me. Father, we come to you as we prepare to take the cup. Just so thankful for the blood that was shed on the cross so that someday we will be able to be with you in heaven and to see your glory in all that there is to see. It will be more than we can imagine and more than we can even fantasize today. Lord, we look to that day. We ask that you forgive us. We ask that you help us to continue to be a light in this world every day of this new year as we reset and begin the next chapters. Lord, we ask these things in your loving son's name. Amen. As we prepare to, to give back to the Lord, I mean, we say it all the time, every time we get up here, that we are blessed. And truly, we are blessed beyond our wildest imagination in most cases. It, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to, we get complacent, I guess, in what we do and what we have. As we prepare to give back, let's just keep our minds and our hearts open to, to that. And in Matthew 10, it says, freely you have received, freely you give. Will you pray with me? Father, we just come to you again, just amazed at how you bless us each day, how you watch over us and protect us how you guide and direct us in many ways, in all things. Lord, just continue that as we go forth in this beginning of a new year, as we get prepared to to do the many wonders that you have for us this year. Lord, just watch over us, keep our hearts and our eyes and our ears open to your ways so that we can continue to be a light in this dark world. We just ask these things in your loving son's name. Amen.
This next song is uh, energetic, high energy, and it's, it's about walking together, so it's kind of hard to do that sitting down. I, I apologize, we were just, I had you stand a minute ago, but let's go ahead and stand. Um, as we sing on and on, we walk together. Mm -hmm. My Savior daily walks with me, I trust, trust His love. In all that's best His hand I see, it points to heaven above. I will follow Him through shadows dim, or in the sunshine bright. And on we walk together, leads my steps around. Are you telling me that Christ was alive when the world was created? A surprise student quizzed me in Bible class. We had just read Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, where Paul says of Jesus, by him all things were created. The apostle emphasizes the eternal nature of Christ by telling us, he is before all things. So the response of this student in that Bible class that morning, how can this be, she protested. I thought Jesus was born in Bethlehem. In her mind, Jesus was like any other baby. He came into existence when he was born. And it had never occurred to her that Christ had coexisted with God before time began. And that's just a little portion of the article that's actually published in your newsletter today by Gene Shelburne it, that was originally published in Power for Today. And the question that this student poses I don't think is really out of the ordinary at all. I think there's probably a lot of people that thought Jesus came into existence when he was born in Bethlehem. But as we're going to discover in John's prologue, the prologue to John's gospel, that's really not the case at all. We are going to focus on the eternal nature of Jesus, among other things in these short verses in the opening of John's gospel. As we think about this, I look back to just the last several weeks. One of the things I really tried to accomplish during the month of December 
was to focus on the miraculous birth of Jesus, every aspect of that miraculous birth, which also included the miraculous birth of John the Baptist as well. I want us to have at least some kind of inkling of that to lead into what we're going to consider this morning. A portion of the prologue to John's gospel in the first five verses of John 1. Sounds much like Genesis in its language in the very opening verses of Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So our journey through the Gospel of John begins by affirming the deity of Christ. What a fancy word to use on the first day of a new year. Affirms the very idea that Jesus is God. Jesus is not just another man. Jesus is not just a prophet. Jesus is not just someone who had good teachings. The deity of Christ, he is God. God. And so we begin our new year by affirming that very reality and how it impacts us as well. So what I want to do this morning as we think about just these opening three verses in particular in John 1 is to spend some energy considering the greatness of Jesus. The greatness in the sense that he was with God in the beginning and that he is God and furthermore that all things were created through him. He was instrumental in the creation process itself. So we begin with this, this reality, the word as he is referred to. The word is eternal. He had no beginning and he will have no end. Now I fully realize that's a little difficult to wrap our minds around this. The, the idea of eternity the concept that Jesus had no beginning and no end, that, that's very complex. And yet there's a complexity to it that affirms that he is God and we are not. And so in one aspect of that is in our humanity, in our limited human understanding, it's difficult for us to wrap our minds around the mystery of eternity, the mystery that he is eternal and had no beginning nor will he have any end either. Now, the, the language that John uses is pretty unique as well. He refers to Jesus as the Word. Now, I'm just a good old West Texas guy. When I think of a word, I think of someone saying, hey, I want you to step outside. I want to have a word with you. Or I think of a word on the printed page. I'm, my, my understanding of the term word is, is pretty limited. And so we need to have at least a a limited appreciation for Greek philosophy to understand how John is using the term word. In Greek philosophy, as they made reference to the origin of the universe and the origin of human beings, they didn't explain the origin of the universe in terms of an all-powerful creator, a personal creator who not only created the world but continues to sustain the world. They use this term logos in Greek, or the word. And it's this inanimate concept, if you will, that they attributed to the creation of the universe. Sound a little crazy? If it does, it is a little crazy. So what John does, he, he uses language that, that they would appreciate. He, he uses a reference from their own culture to refer to Jesus. So this this thing that you call the Word, well, actually it's very personal. The Word is Jesus. And by the way, his, He is eternal. So again, sounds a lot like Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So as one writer says, before any conceivable point in the eternal past, 
the Word was already existing. The Word, therefore, has no beginning. The Word has always existed. Jesus has always existed. He did not have his ultimate origin at the time of birth in Bethlehem. Now, here's a a second aspect of the greatness of Jesus. He is eternally in relationship that there is this very intimate relationship between God the Father and God the Son that, again, it's very difficult for us to wrap our minds around. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So there has always existed the deepest equality and intimacy in the Holy Trinity. Again, that's hard for us to imagine, a, a closeness that's well beyond the scope of any closeness that we have ever experienced in our life. There is a true oneness that exists and an equality as well. David read this text during our communion time. And I want us to pause again and read this section in Philippians that was likely part of an old ancient hymn. It's sometimes referred to as the Christ hymn, Philippians 2, 5 through 8. And let's just pause for a moment. And if I can, re-engage your attention. Pause and take a deep breath. And in the most reverent, worshipful way, just hear this passage, maybe read along, and think of its impact in your life, in your relationships with one another. Have the same mindset as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so in the prologue to John's gospel, we think of the intimacy, the oneness that that exists between God the Father and God the Son. And Paul takes that concept of that oneness and that equality and develops it into this beautiful poetic piece here that we know as Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Well, not only as we think about the intimacy that existed between God the Father and God the Son and that He was eternal, but He is eternally God. Jesus is deity. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I think in just a a preliminary understanding of Scripture, I can remember being a new Christian and reading this and thinking, "I, I think I'm just a little bit confused. The Word was God. Who is the Word? And coming to an understanding, Jesus is God. And as R. Kent Hughes says, the phrase perfectly preserves Jesus's separate identity while also stating that he is God, the deity of Christ. That is a component. That is the essence of his greatness, his superiority in whom we worship. And finally, Jesus, the eternal creator, John 1, 3. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Now, if that's not a mouthful, I don't know what is. One more time. Through him, all things were made. He was a significant part of the whole creative process. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And so I'm reminded of this beautiful passage in Revelation. It's another one of those passages that just really puts you in a very worshipful, reverent frame of mind. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, is the revelation is revealed to John. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things, and by your will they were created and have 
their being. What a blessing to think about from Revelation. So I'm coming back this morning to the two questions. Do you believe in Jesus? If I were to ask you that most basic question, do you believe in Jesus? Of course I do. But do you believe in Jesus who is the image of the invisible God, to use the language from Colossians? Do you believe in Jesus who is the image of the invisible God and the exact representation of his being? Do you believe in Jesus who is eternal? Underscore the word is. Do you believe in Jesus who is eternal? And thirdly, do you believe in Jesus who created all things? He was there. He was instrumental in the creation process itself. So the second question, again, I'm going to come back to these same two questions repeatedly during the course of this series, focusing on the Gospel of John. How do these truths impact your faith? And you may be a little surprised where I'm headed with this this morning. I want to quote again from Hughes, and he says, We can trust such a God with everything because... He is creator, and he knows just what his creation, his people need. And I'm not sure I've ever reflected on John 1 in in that particular posture before. I've always appreciated, okay, the, the eternal nature of Jesus, he is God, and he was instrumental in creation, but what are the implications of it? I don't think I've ever really paused to stop and think, What are the implications of these truths, of these realities? So if we pause to think, not only is Jesus our Redeemer, not only is He our Savior, not only did He die on a cross on our behalf, but He is also our Creator as well. And because He is Creator, He knows just what His creation, His people need. He has a more intimate understanding of us than we could possibly comprehend in our limited minds. So as I reflected on this thought, it brought up a couple of other passages. Sometimes one passage triggers another passage, and it brought up a couple other passages. I thought about the text in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So as I think about the, what exists, the oneness that exists between God the Father and God the Son, that God knows what we need before we ask Him. He has this understanding of our very hearts And so as we come, he knows our hearts. He knows what we're thinking. He knows exactly what we're experiencing in life at this very moment. So that's one of those implications of Jesus being instrumental in our very creation. And then I was also reminded of Psalm uh, Psalm 139, 23 and 24, where David says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That that with confidence we can come knowing fully well that he knows us and he knows us so, so very well. So the prologue to John's gospel affirms the existence of an all-powerful creator. And we go back to the language of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And as I mentioned a moment ago, this language of the opening verse of John's gospel sounds so much like Genesis because it is a lot like Genesis. And then what's also included in Genesis in verse 26 is, and God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness. And I don't know if you've ever noticed before, but think about the language that's used here. Let us, suggesting the idea of the Trinity. Let us, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, the presence of Jesus. So I come back to this lady who was in Bible class, 
and Gene Shelburne's teaching his class, and, and he's talking about the preexistence of Jesus. He's talking about John 1, just like we have looked at this morning. And she says, are you telling me that Christ was alive when the world was created? And as we have just read these opening verses in John's gospel, we can say, yes. He was alive when the world was created. In fact, we can go on as far to say, yes, he is eternal. An eternal, all-powerful God whom we have the distinct blessing of worshiping. I think the most appropriate way to begin our new year is to focus on the very greatness of Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing our invitation song this morning. In need of grace, in need of love, in need of mercy raining down from high above, in need of strength, in need of peace, in need of things that only you can give to me, in need of Christ, the perfect Lamb, my refuge strong, the great I am. Got one more song before we dismiss here in just a minute with a prayer.
another year has come and gone, and uh, I was sitting in the audience uh, thinking back to about 1981, 82, somewhere around there, and if it wasn't for a person sitting in the auditorium this morning, I wouldn't be here. He opened his home, him and his wife opened their home to me and shared the gospel with me. Before that, I was about as wild and crazy as... I was like John, only worse. Okay? <laughs> but the message is, Jesus saves and changes lives. We're building a new auditorium over here. It's not for you. It's all for all of those out there that need Christ in their lives, that need a change in their lives. Jesus saves. We want to thank you for being here this morning. Uh, the church assembles not only in this building, but throughout the world. We all are gathered in his name, and our hope is in his name. And we hold the higher ground because our home is in heaven. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful, Lord, for this day that you have blessed us with. We're thankful, Lord, for this last year that you have given us in our lives. So many changes, so many events took place, good ones, bad ones, but we got through it all. We begin a new year, Lord, with hope in our hearts, knowing that we can look to you and find peace and be still in our hearts in the name of your Son. We ask a blessing on those that are gathered all throughout the world in this morning, throughout this day. We're one family, Lord, and we look forward to the day that we can assemble together in heaven. This we pray for and ask in your son's holy name. Amen.